How are you? Good. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another hour of English classes here on Verbling.com. My name is Lisa, and I'm one of the many English teachers here on this website, Verbling.com. We have lots of different teachers who are all native speakers of English, and some of us are from the United States, like myself. I'm from, well, I'm living in Washington State. I'm originally from California, but I've been living in Washington State uh, on the West Coast for about 11 years now. So that's a long time. Time flies. Okay, and we have other teachers who are from Canada and England, and they live in different countries around the world. So every time you come to Verbling, you're going to see um, probably somebody new, somebody different. We have different ways of teaching, different ways of speaking, um, but it's all good stuff, all good and helpful stuff to um, help you guys improve your English skills. Um, in this hour, we're going to be working on reading, which I like especially because it involves speaking, out loud, it involves pronunciation, it involves grammar, it involves vocabulary, and um, it's usually interesting, and it's actually the whole uh, reason to learn another language is to be able to use it. So we're going to be using English to read this article, and it's pretty long actually, so I don't know if we're going to have much time to talk about it in this class, but I do have the next hour as well as a speaking class. And we're going to keep the same topic of love, though we might go in different directions with the conversation and the questions. If you have a reservation for this class, maybe you're just ending uh, the last class, um, but it's good if you can make it for the first two minutes after I start the class, because that's when you get to use your reservation. Um, if you don't make it in the first two minutes, then the join class button becomes available to everybody. So any Verbling.com member can join a class at any time. Um, sometimes even if it's in the last 10 minutes and you want to get the last bit, you can join the class. Um, it's okay. And um, yeah, so every class is one hour long and they all start usually just about right on the hour, maybe one minute or two minutes later, depending on if the teacher was teaching the last class as well. So it takes a little bit of time to transition. Um, but I'm just waiting, doing a little introduction here while we uh, have people join us. So I can say hi to everybody. Uh, welcome back, Yuki. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. She's wishing us well in our class. <laughs> hi there. Okay, so Yuki, hi Yuki, hi Nihan, hi Leonardo, Gustavo, Gregory, hi. Diana, and Carlos. Welcome to class, everybody. Um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have room for two more students. So if you uh, are coming and you're just joining us and you're thinking about um, joining us, then you can click on the article here. One of the nice things about the reading classes is that you can follow along even if you don't get into the Google Hangouts so you can read along with us. Um, okay, Bruno and Hussein, hi there. Welcome you guys. Um, so I think I know pretty much everybody. Bruno, hi Bruno. Bruno, where are you calling from? I'm from Brazil. Brazil, Minas Gerais. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. I'm looking at your yeah. Google Plus profile. <laughs> That's how I know. Okay, yeah. welcome everybody. And Gustavo, where are you calling in from? Hello, I'm from Argentina. Oh, okay, wonderful. Welcome. <laughs> okay, so okay. let me just uh, welcome you all, and let me put the article in my screen share so we can all read it. Okay, I'm g can you guys see it? Not yet, but um, I was going to play with maybe uh, reducing the size of the the font. Is it still okay like that, or should I make it bigger? It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Uh, a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger is good. Okay, I'll make it a little bigger. Okay, good. 
So yes, you have two options for reading along. You can click on the link and open up uh, the document. These You see people here have opened up the document. Or you can just look at my screen and follow along from the screen. It's really up to you, whatever's the easiest for you to do. Let me just um, um, introduce this article a little bit. It, like I said, it's pretty long, so I'm not sure if we'll be actually able to read the entire article. We'll see how it goes, um, depending on how much vocabulary I go over and everything. But it's an interesting article. It's actually a science-related <laughs> article. So the topic is love, but um, it's about what happens to us kind of in our brain. When, and so they're trying to figure it out. So as you can see, it's, it's kind of long here. And um, the link to the article is right here at the bottom. And it's a website I found uh, about two weeks ago that I thought was interesting um, for science-related articles because it's written for students, like uh, high school and college level students um, here in the United States. So the articles, are some are short, some are long. And they always um, give you some vocabulary words and things like that. Um, so it might be a, a website that you might be interested in if you like to read about science in English. OK, so let's just get started. The way we do this is I will read, and then I will have you guys read after me, and then I will go over some vocabulary. If at any time you have a question, you don't understand something, it's not making sense, I'll do my best to try to say it a different way, provide another example, um, and make sure that you understand uh, the structure of the sentence and why certain words are being used. But most importantly is the meaning. Figure out, you know, like understanding what the, the author is trying to get a, across to us as the readers. Okay. Um, it's called When Cupid's Arrow Strikes. So I'm pretty sure you guys have all heard of Cupid, but I want to make sure you guys know what we're talking about here. <laughs> this is a picture of Cupid. And I didn't really even think about it, but um, this Friday is Valentine's Day. So uh, I probably see a lot of Cupids around um, on the Internet the, this week because um, at least here, I'm not sure, is it Valentine's Day in your country too? <laughs> Yuki, does Russia have Valentine's Day? Yuki? No, I or think... Nihon, or Nihon, or anybody? Uh, yeah, uh, Go ahead, Yuki. There is a Valentine's Day also in, in Russia. But, but it is uh, completely different. How, how people celebrate Valentine's Day is completely uh -huh. different. Uh, 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 differ from J Japan's one. Okay. Well, yeah. maybe we could talk about that in another class later this week because that would be interesting. I wasn't actually thinking of that when I found this article, but it's just something to throw in there. Maybe some other teachers might be talking about Valentine's Day as well. Okay, so when Cupid's arrow strikes, that means you got hit with the arrow and you fell in love. Okay, the subtitle is Many of the Feelings and obsessions associated with love can be explained by a few key chemicals research suggests. So that's basically this article. So what happens when we start feeling this emotion um, or he says it becomes like an obsession when you're in love and really we can break it down into some um, chemical <laughs> responses or reactions that we have in our brain. So this person Susan Gaidos wrote this article and starts off, your heart is racing, your palms are sweaty, and your appetite gone. You couldn't sleep if you tried. Focusing on schoolwork is nearly impossible. You realize you must be sick, or even more serious, in love. Few feelings are as intense and overwhelming as love. You feel elated and stimulated one minute. The next, you are anxious or pining. Millions of songs have focused on the ups and downs that come with love. Poets and writers have spilled vats of ink trying to capture the experience. When Arthur Aaron found himself in the throes of love, he did something different. He set out to investigate what happens to the brain. Okay, 
So we'll skip the title. I already read that. And Bruno, why don't you start by reading the part that I just read? So all of this right there. Okay. <coughs> um, your heart is racing. Your palms are sweaty, and your appetite gone. You couldn't sleep if you tried. Pot was on. School work is nearly impossible. You realize you must be sick or even more serious in love. Two feelings are as intense and overwhelming as love. You feel elated and simulated one minute. The next, you are anxious or pining. Millions of songs have focused on the ups and downs that come with love. Poets and writers have spied weights of ink trying to capture the experience. When Arthur Aaron found himself in the throe, throes of love, mm -hmm. he did something different. He set out to investigate what happens to the brain. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so now I will review or go over some of these words that you may or may not know. And if there's anything that I don't go over that you want to know, <clears throat> excuse me, you want to know, uh, just ask me. So. Your heart is racing. Racing means going very fast. So your heartbeat is beating very quickly, very fast. Your palms of your hands are sweaty, so they're like wet with sweat. And you don't have an appetite. It's gone. These are kind of like the signs. And you might think that you're sick, but he, she says even more serious. You might be in love. So in English, we say that we are in love or that we fell in love with somebody. Um, she's saying that few feelings, so you guys understand the word feelings, being happy, being in love, feeling angry, those are our feelings. Um, they are few of them, so not a lot of them are so intense or overwhelming as love. Overwhelming means it's like it's what, what you think about all the time. It's just like the, the, the dominant emotion that you're having or feeling. It's, it's overwhelming you. It's like the only thing you can think about. Uh, you feel elated, which means happy, excited. You're really, in, in, you know, just um, energetic because you're so happy. And stimulated. You're like really looking around everywhere and you're very um, aware of what's going on in one minute. But then the next minute, this is what happens when you're in love. You feel anxious, like you're nervous or you're pining. Pining means you're like wishing you could be with the person you're in love with. You're pining away for that person. You're just like, you know, when, you, when you're in love with somebody and you have to be separated from them for a while, you start wishing you were with them again. That's called pining. And so lots of songs have focused on this. You know, that's the, that's the subject matter of so many songs. And of course, poems and uh, stories and so in this sentence she says, poets and writers have, and this is pronounced, spilled vats of ink. So to spill means like to knock over and have the ink run on the floor. And vats is something very large. Usually you have just a small container of ink. But in this case she's trying to make it, um, you know, talk about that lots and lots and lots has been written about love. And so they've spilled vats of ink, you know, written lots to capture the experience, to try to explain what it's like to be in love. So lots of poet, poets and writers have tried to do that. And then she's talking about this guy here, Arthur Aaron, who found himself in the throes of love. If you find yourself or if you are in the throes of love, it means you're in love. The throes is like you don't, you're like helpless. You don't, you can't do anything against it. You're just, you're caught by love and you're in like an embrace of love. But he did something different than what most people do. He set out to investigate. So to set out means he started on like a, when you set out for an adventure, it's mean when you start your adventure. So he started to figure out what goes on in the brain when you're in love. It was the late 1960s and Aaron was a student at the University of California, Berkeley. Working to complete a master's degree in psychology, he looked forward someday to having a career as a college professor. His studies focused on the way people work and relate in small groups. Then Cupid intervened. 
Aaron fell for Elaine, a fellow student. When he thought of her, he experienced all the symptoms of new love, euphoria, sleeplessness, loss of appetite, and an overwhelming desire to be near her. Everything was intense, exciting, and sometimes confusing. To sort through the fog, Aaron began searching for published data about what goes on in the minds of people in love, and he turned up almost nothing. At that time, few researchers had begun probing the biology of romantic love. Okay. So we just go in line here. Carlos, you're next. It was the late 1960s. Okay, where, where, where am I going to finish, teacher? You're going to finish doo -doo 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 -doo. right here. Romantic love will be the last part. So a couple of paragraphs there. Three. Oh, okay, romantic love. Yeah, I can highlight okay. it for you. There you go. Okay, it was the late 1960s and Aaron was a student at the University of California, Berkeley. Working to complete a master's degree in psychology, he looked forward someday to having a career as a college professor. His studies focused on the way people work and relate in small groups, then Cupid in urban. Aaron fell for Elaine, a fellow student, when he thought of her experience, all the symptoms of new love, euphoria, sleeplessness, loss of appetite, and an overwhelming desire to be near here, to be near her. Everything was intense, exciting and sometimes confusing. To soar through the fog, Aaron began searching for published data about what goes on in the minds of people in love and he turned up almost nothing. At the time, few researchers had begun probing the biology of romantic love. Good. Okay, so what happened to him is when he fell in love and he set out to figure out what is going on in his brain, because you know he was studying psychology, a master's degree in psychology, and so that was something that was interesting uh, to him, so Cupid intervened. So sorry about that. In this part, it's telling you that he was studying psychology, but then Cupid intervened, which means Cupid shot him with the arrow and he fell in love. <laughs> and so to intervene means to come into play there between him and his studies. And what happened was he fell in love or he fell for Elaine. To fall for somebody means you fall in love with them. You fall for that person. And she was a fellow student, so a student just like him, a friend of um, his. And he had all the symptoms, so the symptoms, the things that happened to him. Euphoria, he was just like super excited. When you're euphoric or you experience euphoria, it means you're just like, on. we say on cloud nine, you're just floating around, everything's beautiful, everything's wonderful. Um, you can't sleep, you're sleeplessness, you have sleeplessness. You have a loss of appetite, so you're not hungry. And you have a strong or overwhelming desire or want or need to be close to that person. So he wanted to be near his new love, Elaine. Okay, so this was very intense, exciting, confusing. So he wanted to sort through the fog. The fog is like when you have low clouds and you can't see. It's thick fog. You can't really see very well. And so when you're in love, sometimes it's like you are in a fog. You, you're not very clear-headed, and you do crazy things. So he was interested in trying to figure out what is going on here. And at that time, he turned up. That means he found almost nothing. So there wasn't really much scientific research that had been done. So there hadn't been any probing. Probing is testing. When you probe something, you test it. So um, the scientists at that time had not probed or had not begun probing um, or testing or researching the biology of romantic 
love. So when you fall in love with somebody. So Aaron dove into the topic himself. Sorry. He, yes. Uh, to, throw, to sort through the fog. A yep. sort is, I think, verb. What does it mean? Yes. So this is a, like a phrasal verb here, to sort through. So to sort means, okay, so let's say, Yuki, you went and you got your mail from your mailbox. And you have a bunch of different bills and some things from, you know, oh. different people. And you're going to sort your mail. You're going to put all your bills in one pile and some other things in another pile. You're going to sort through it. That, that's what you're doing with your mail. But what he's trying to do, and so you sort through something to, so you can understand it better. It's like to organize something. But in this case, he wants to sort through the fog, and the fog is representing the um, confusion that he has about love. You know, why, is it, why are all these things happening to me? You know, I'm not hungry, I'm crazy, I, you know, I can't sleep. That's kind of like the fog that you're in when you're in love. You're, you're confused. And so he wants to figure it out. So to sort through is kind of like figure out uh, or understand the confusion. He wants to understand what does this mean. So to sort through the fog, another way to say that means to understand something better, something that's not clear, because the fog is not clear. You know, if you have fog at um, in the winter, we have fog, and you're driving on the road, and you can't see if there's fog, if it's really thick fog, it's hard to see. So does that make sense? I can sort, sort of through that fog, thank you. Yes. Fog, fog is like, it's like uh, clouds, no? Yes, when they're low to the ground. And okay. So if you're driving and there's the fog, some places like where I used to live in California, they have really thick fog like this time of year in the morning or late at night. It makes it very difficult to see uh, where you're driving the roads because yes. it can, yeah. So that's kind okay. of it. He, so he had all this confusion and he was trying to sort through it. You know, if you sort through your problems, you know, I have to sort through this problem. It means I have to figure out what's going on. How can I understand this? better. And that's what he's trying to do. Understand what is this thing we call romantic love? Why are all these things happening? And why do they seem to happen to everybody? Okay. So Aaron dove into the topic himself. He continued his research at the University of Toronto where he wrote a long report on the subject. He also married his sweetheart, Elaine. Today he teaches psychology at the Stony Brook University in New York. When he's not teaching, he continues to study what happens when we fall in love. Recently, he teamed up with other scientists to peer into the noggins of people giddy with love. Their goal was to map love's impact on the brain. The studies reveal that when shown a sweetie's picture, a person's brain will fire up in the same areas that respond when anticipating a favorite food or other pleasure. What we're seeing is the same response, more or less, that people show when they expect to win a lot of money or expect to have something very good happen to them, Aaron says. All right, so that's what they find. Diana. Yeah. Start with, so Aaron dove into the topic himself. Okay. So Aaron dove into the topic himself. He continued his research at the University of Toronto, where he wrote a long report on the subject. He also married his sweetheart, Elaine. Today, he, te he teaches uh, psychology at the Stony Brook University in New York. When he's not teaching, he continues to study what happens when we fall in love. Uh, recently, he teamed up with other science scientists peer into the noggins of people uh, giddy with love. Their goal uh, was to map uh, love's impact of the brain. The studies reveal that when shown a sweetest picture, a person's brain will fire up in the same areas that respond when an anticipating a favorite food of their pleasure or, or other pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, what we are seeing in the same response, more or less, is that people show uh, when they expect to win a lot of money or expect to have something very good happen to them, Aaron says. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. 
So Aaron dove into the topic himself. To dive into something, that's the phrasal verb, means that you put your all of yourself into it. So he started studying the topic. He dove into it. It means he started researching it himself. You can dive into a lot of things. So if you like go to the library and you get a book and you dive into it, it means you start reading it and you really do a lot. So you might read like 100 pages the first night or something like that. If you're, if you're at a university and you're studying and you dive into your studies, it means you start studying a lot that topic. So he dove into the topic himself. He started to study it. He also married his sweetheart. So we have a couple of words here, different ways of calling people that you love. One is a sweetheart. You can call your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whatever a sweetheart. Um, all right, so he wanted to know what happens when we fall in love. He uh, teamed up with, so that means he worked together as a team with some other scientists to peer into the noggins. Okay, so to peer into, another phrasal verb, means to look into. So to peer is to look. So And then the, the noggins means the heads. <laughs> so he was looking into the heads. That's where the brain is. So looking into the heads or the noggins of people who were giddy with love. Giddy means like, oh, I'm so excited. You know, you're just like really excited and you're kind of, kind of just crazy with love. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, yes. nogging, it's not a slang word for it head. Is. Yeah, it so is, but it's not is really it? slang. It's yeah. not so slang. This is academic writing. <laughs> so Yeah, so it's yeah. academic writing, so I'm just interested. Yeah, it's a, it's a um, in, I wouldn't say too much slang. It's more like an informal. So it is curious that they're using it here, but it's... Um, just an, a fun way of saying it, I guess. It's it's okay. it's very well known. Yeah, your noggin, you know. <laughs> it okay. kind of sounds funny, but it just means your head, and of course they're studying the brain. So, mm -hmm. in your your noggin, yeah. And um, I mean, it's it's academic writing, but it's not like a, it's not submitted to like a, a Nature magazine or something, you know, a okay. peer-reviewed article or something. Yeah, it's kind of a summary more of their of those types of articles. Um, so giddy with love, really excited and happy. Um, and what their studies are revealing or what they're showing is that when you see you know, the, a picture of your sweetie, so that's another term of endearment, um, somebody you love, um, your brain will fire up. That means light up. So when they're looking at the MRI or something, they'll see that there has activity there. So that means to fire up. To fire up something means to start it. Usually, like, if you say, I'm going to go fire up my car because, you know, it's been, it's been snowing or something you need to leave. I'm going to go fire up my car. I'm going to start my car. But in this case, it's the brain kind of lighting up in, in terms of electro electricity. And the, it was in the same areas. <laughs> this is kind of funny. When, when we're thinking about um, our favorite food, anticipating means when you're waiting for it. You're, you're going to the restaurant, and you just ordered your favorite food, and now you're waiting for it to come your brain is lighting up in a certain area because you're expecting something you really love, something you enjoy, something that gives you pleasure. So it's the same area of the brain. That's what's um, happening. Also, it's in the same area that lights up when we think we're going to uh, win a lot of money or have something very good happen to us. His research, along with studies led by other experts, is helping explain the science of love. All that mystery, all those songs, and all those complex behaviors can be explained, at least in part, by the surge of just a few chemicals in our brain. Love the drug. Most people think of love as an emotion, but it's not, Aaron says. Love actually is more of a drive, like hunger or addiction. Love isn't a unique emotion, but it leads to all kinds of emotions if you can't get what you want, Aaron says. To learn more, Aaron teamed up with neuroscientist Lucy Brown, who teaches at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City, and anthropologist Helen Fisher of Rutgers University in nearby New Brunswick, New Jersey, that stands for New Jersey. Together they are studying the brains of people newly in love. Okay. 
<laughs> All right, those crazy, crazy people. Everything crazy is people. simple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gregory, you want to read that part? Yes. <laughs> His research, along with studies led by others at first, is helping to explain this science of love. All that mystery, all those songs and all those complex behavior can be explained, at least in part, by the search of just a few chemicals in your brain. Love, the drug. Most people think of love as an, an emotion, but it's not, Aaron says. Love actually is more of a drive, like hunger or addiction. Love isn't a unique emotion, but it leads to all kinds of emotion of you can't uh, get what you want, Aaron said. Um, to learn more, Aaron teamed up with um, neuroscientist Lucy Brown, who teaches at the Albert Einstein College of medicine in New York City and anthropologist Helen Fisher of uh, uh, Rutgers University in nearby New Brunswick and Jay together uh, say are studying the brains of people newly in love. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So the surge of the surge is like. Um, uh, when a, a bunch of electricity happens all at one time, that's called a surge. So that's what happens. Um, you know, these complex behaviors are really being caused by just this this surge. This all of a sudden having a lot of energy or lighting up in of some chemicals in our brains. So that's why they're saying love the drug, and they're trying to tell us that even though we think of it as like an emotion, how we feel. It's more like a drive, something like hung, we are, we're driven to go eat something because we're hungry or when we're addicted to something we have this drive that makes us want to go and get it. And so again the, the phrase here to team up with, so that means to work together on a team. Um, and New, NJ is New Jersey, in the United States we have uh, two letter abbreviations for every state. Um, so we use, you'll see those a lot in articles. Um, and he wants to study the brains of people newly in love. So a lot of these um, symptoms that people have are in the very beginning stages of being in love with somebody. Kind of, it's a new sensation. All right. So for one study, each of their love-struck recruits started by filling out a questionnaire designed to gauge the intensity of his or her feelings. The scientists then rolled each volunteer into the giant cylinder of a big machine to see which brain regions are most affected by love. The machine is called a Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging or fMRI scanner. It detects, the cha it detects changes in the flow of blood in various parts of the brain. Increased flow generally identifies areas that have become more active. While, the, while in the scanner, subjects viewed a heartthrobs photo. At the same time, scientists asked them to recall their most romantic memories. Each recruit also looked at photos of friends or other people they knew. While the volunteers viewed all of these snapshots, the researchers asked them to remember something about the subject of each. Okay. Gustavo. Okay, Lisa, I will try. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, for on study, no? One study, yep. Okay. For for one study, each of their love stroke recruits started by filling out a questionnaire designed to gauge the intensity of his of her feelings. The scientists then rolled each volunteer into the giant cylinders of a big machine to see which brain region of are most affected by love. The machine is called a functional magnetic resonance imaging or 
FMIRI scanner. It detects change in the flow of blood in various parts of the brain. Increased flow generally identifies areas that have become more active. active. Mm -hmm. While in the scanner, subjects view it a hair's throat, you know? Mm -hmm. Heart throbs, photo. Yep. Heart throat photo. At the same time, scientists ask them to recall their most romantic memories. Each recruit, recruit also mm -hmm. looked at photos of friends, friends or other people they knew. While the volunteers viewed all the, this snapshot, the researchers asked them to remember something about the subject of each. Mm -hmm. Good. So, okay. love struck recruit. So, a recruit is somebody that you recruit. So, the verb to recruit um, it means you go and you get somebody to do something. In this case, the study. They, they recruited people to be in the study, and so they call those people recruits. And of course, they want love struck, so struck by love. So they are in love, these recruits. And they start by filling out a questionnaire. Uh, the verb to, phasal verb to fill out, means you, you, know, you write, you answer all these questions. Then this was um, specifically to measure or to gauge the intensity. How, you know, how in love were they? How much was this affecting their life? So they put them in this big machine. And the machine is called the fMRI, and it's a scanner that uh, scans your the flow of blood in parts of your brain. And so what they noticed was increased flow, so more flow. Um, well, sorry. What the way you read the scan is that if you see an area has more flow, that means that it's more active. That's that part of the brain is being uh, used more or activated more. So that's how you read a scan. So based on that information, they were trying to see what, you know, what lights up when, the, when certain things happen. So they had the subjects or the recruits, the people, look at heartthrobs. So that's another thing. Uh, sweetheart, sweetie, heartthrob, this is the person you love. So pictures of the person you love. Um, it's called heartthrob because it makes your heart throb looking at that person. <laughs> so your throbbing means beating. Your heart throbs or it beats for this person. And then they asked these people to recall their most romantic memories. So to recall means to remember, to think about, think back in the past and think about something that was very romantic with your sweetheart. And then they also wanted to compare. So they had them look at just the friends or other people. Um, at snapshots. Snapshots are just pictures, photos. And then they would ask them to remember other things about the, those people, so to see what is different you know, in the brain. After viewing each image of a buddy or bow, the volunteers were asked to count backward from a large number. This helped keep separate the different emotional responses they had after viewing each photograph. Bringing the volunteers down from any romantic high ensured there wasn't any spillover when they went on to view pictures of ordinary friends. Throughout all of this, the fMRI machine kept logging activity levels throughout each person's brain. It's hard to quickly cut off those highly romantic feelings and go from being swept away by romance to being stone cold bare or objective. Brown says. Still, that was the goal here, and Brown says the brain scans showed that when people look at pictures of their sweeties, several brain areas turn on. Two, in particular, light up among people still in the early sizzle of love. One is called the ventral tegmental area, located deep at the back of the brain in the brain stem. This group of neurons controls feelings of motivation and reward. A second center of activity is called the caudate nucleus. This small area is located near the front of the head, toward the center of the brain, sort of like the area that you find seeds in a pear. 
Okay, those are two long paragraphs there. I'm very sorry. Uh, yes. Previous mm -hmm. uh, um, line, I saw, uh, subject build a uh, heart throb photo. Uh, could you explain again about subject? What does it mean in this case? Well, in the scanner, subjects, it means the people who are in the scanner. Uh, who are in the scanner? You are researchers. Yeah. Uh, the people that are um, recruited to do the research on, not the scientists, but the subjects, uh, the subjects of the research. So they are the people who agreed to go into the scanner who are in love. Uh, they are the subjects of the research. They are being studied. People who are recruit, recruited for, for recruit. the mm -hmm. study. Yes, yeah? exactly. Uh, okay, okay. Thank, yep. thank, you. thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, Leonardo. Yes. You can start reading right there. After viewing each image. Okay. I will try it like uh, Gustavo says. <laughs> you guys are doing great. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> After we viewing each image of a body of view, the volunteers were asked to count backward from a large number. This helped keep separate the different emotional response they have after we viewing each pho photograph. Bringing the volunteers down for, from any romantic high ensure there wasn't any speed lover when they went to went on to view pictures of ordinary friends. Throw out all of this, the FMRI machine keep logging activity levels throughout each person's brain. It's hard to quickly cut off these highly romantic feelings and go from being swept away by romance to being a stone cold bear or objective, Brown says. Still, that was the wall here. And Brown says that the brain scan showed that when people look at the picture of their sweeties, several brains are areas turn on. Um, that is all? Or oh, you keep continue? reading the next paragraph too. Okay. <clears throat> Two in particular lie, lie up among people steering the early Sisley of love. Mm -hmm. One is called the ventral mental area, located deep at, at the back of the brain, in the brain stem. This group of neurons control feelings of motivation and rewards. A second center of activity is the cau caudate nucleus. Mm -hmm. This small area is located near the front of the head, toward the center of the brain, sort of the like the area that you find scenes in a peer. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so what's happening here? So after viewing each image of a buddy, so a buddy would be a friend or a beau is your boyfriend. Okay, so what they're trying, what they're trying to do is separate your emotional response. So they have you count backward. Like maybe starting at you know 999, 998, 997, something like that, and that what they think that does is dif you know separate the feelings that you had for your person you're in love with, the romantic high is what they call that, to be high on the romantic feelings while you're looking at the picture, and then to make sure that there wasn't any spillover. Spillover is like that emotion going into when you just look at your friend's picture. Um, it spills over into that. So they don't want that to happen. They want them to be separate responses. So um, that's what they're trying to figure out how to do. But they said it's very hard to cut off, so to stop those um, highly romantic feelings. So they had to figure out a way to, to do that because they noticed that when people were looking at the pictures of their sweeties that they be, you know became um, very emotional with these romantic feelings, but then they had to figure out how to go from there to being 
stone cold bear. So that means like not caring so much or not feeling so romantic or more like objective to feel objective towards just your friend or maybe a relative or something like that. Uh, could you explain again about the stone cold <laughs> bear? Yes. Yeah, st okay. So stone cold bear. So it's it's contrasting. So you're going from being having these highly romantic feelings, you know, you're being swept away by romance when you look at your picture of your boyfriend or your girlfriend, the person you're newly in love with, so it's when it's really still new for you. And you want to go from that to like um, stone cold bear. So think of a stone and think of it being cold and bare. It just is the image of um, no emotion, you know. So here you're going from being in love, oh, I wish I was with that person right now, to like, oh yeah, that's my friend. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like very objective. You're you're um, you're not very emotional. So stone cold bear is describing a state of not very emotional. So you're not feeling romantic or lo loving towards this other person like you were. Does that make sense? A bear is a verb is a noun here. Stone cold bear. Yeah, to be bear. Yeah. Maybe it's adjective. Like, adjective maybe. more. Maybe it's like uh, blood cold, no? Ah, uh, cold blood. When, yeah. Yes, cold blood. When you say uh, another people, it's kind of like yeah. It's more like going from a loving feeling to kind of like a neutral feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, neutral. Yuki, do you understand neutral or like a kind of um, non-emotional? So the stone cold is like you're cold, you know, you're like not having, you're not hot. You know, like when you're, yeah, bear kind of like, empty. yeah, bear, yeah. exactly, bear. Adjective, okay. Uh-huh, adjective, yeah. Thank you, Stone bear. cold bear, yeah, being bear means you don't have it, it bear, it can also means like naked, so you have no clothes on, you know, you're bear, um, and so it's kind of like you you have no emotions, no strong romantic emotions when you're looking at this other picture. That's what it's talking about. And then we see again, sweetie. So, and then here a couple of words. Um, in particular, light up. So again, the the areas of the brain are two areas. Um, when the sizzle of love. Sizzle is like when you um, are cooking something and it sizzles, like a meat on a grill or something. It's sizzling. It's the noise that it makes. It's hot. Um, so we have some technical terms here. Parts of the brain that are getting activated and the neurons, which are the nerves. Um, so we don't need to worry about that too much. It's just two areas of the brain. Um, you know, one at the brain stem and one in the front of the head. That's pretty much all we need to know because this isn't a science lesson too much. <laughs> the caudate nucleus associated with the passion of love. It can make your hand or voice tremble when you're near your sweetheart and make you think of nothing else but them, Brown explains. During the brain scanning, both brain areas lit up like a Las Vegas slot machine whenever the recruits saw a heartthrob's image, but not at other times. Both the ventral tegmental area and caudate nucleus are involved in very basic functions such as eating, drinking, and swallowing, Brown says. These are things people do without thinking. Indeed, she notes, much of the activity that goes on in those areas is done at the unconscious level. That may be one of the reasons that the feelings associated with early love are so hard to control. Okay. And Nihan. The caudate nucleus associ associated with the person of love. It can make your hand or voice tremble when you are near your sweetheart and make you think of nothing else but them. Brown explains, during the brain scanning, both brain areas lit up like a Las Vegas slot machine whenever the recruits saw a heart drop image, but not other times. Both the ventral tegmental area and the caudate nucleus are involved in very basic functions such as eating, drinking, and swallowing brown says. These are things people do without thinking. Indeed, she knows much of the activity that goes on in those areas is done at the unconscious level. 
that may be one of the reasons that the feeling associated with the early love are so hard to control. Mm -hmm. Good. So basically describing that the passion of love, so the passion is like the feelings that you you know, and your hands shake, they tremble, your voice trembles, that means shake, uh, shakes when you're you know talking to your love, the one you love, the one you're in love with. And let's see, brain areas lit up like a Las Vegas slot machine. So Las Vegas is where all the casinos are and, you know, that lights up when you get like three fruits in a row or something. And so this is what would happen when you were looking at your heartthrob's image or photo, but not at other times. So it did not happen when you were uh, looking at your friends. Um, and the thing they found was interesting that it's like a basic function, these things that we do without even thinking. Um, that's what happens um, to us when we're in love. So it's all done at an unconscious level. We are not even aware that this is happening to us, that we're acting that way or something. And this happens um, when we are in early love, so in the very beginning of being in love with someone. The ventral tegmental area and the caudate nucleus both serve another important function. They are part of the brain's reward system. Each is packed with cells that produce or receive a brain chemical called dopamine, known as a feel-good chemical. Dopamine plays many roles, one of them contributing to feelings of pleasure and reward. When you spy your favorite food or win a big prize, your brain's dopamine levels soar. Dopamine serves as a signaling compound, chatting with other nerve cells. It also helps you to focus intensely on what you really want and it pushes and energizes you to take action and reach your goals. Those goals can include pursuing a romantic interest. Once smitten, a surge of dopamine helps make you feel exhilarated. Okay, Yuki. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, previous uh, paragraph. Yeah. Uh, Sort of like an area that you find seed, seed in, in, a, in a peer. Uh, here, find seed in a peer. I, I can understand it uh, literally or, or another meaning. Where? It's a phrasable, but, but phrasable verb or it's uh, directly such a meaning. Tell me again where you're reading. Uh, this uh, previous paragraph, this small area is located near the front of the head towards the center of the brain, sort of like an area, area that you find the seeds in the, in the pier. I okay. can't understand, find the seeds in the pier. It is, it is a phrasable verb or a direct meaning. A direct meaning. Direct meaning. What yeah. does, it, does it mean? Yeah, so the small area is located near the front of the head. So think of where, like the front of your head toward the center of the brain. Okay, so if you look at a pear, so it said sort of like the area that you find seeds in a pear. So if you look at a pear, let's see, and you know where you, when you open up a pear and yes. you find the seeds kind of in the center there, that's where it is in, like in your brain. So it's not like in the front of your for forehead, it's more like in the center of your brain but towards the front. And so uh, that's what they're saying. Pear is like a, like a, or like uh, a real brain. pear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And yeah. I can't get uh, 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 from here, huh? no? Uh, yeah. Woo, right here from uh, uh, sorry. the ventral tegmental area. The, vent, the ventral teg tegmental. The ventral, te the, the ventral tegmental area and, and the caudate nucleus both serve an another important function. They are part of the brain's reward, reward system. Each of it is packed with, uh, with cells that produce or re receive a brain chemical called dopamine, known as the feel good chemical. Dopamine plays many roles one of them con contributing to feeling of pleasure and reward. When you spy your favorite food or win, win a big prize, 
your brain dopamine, your brain, brain's dopamine levels soar. Dopamine serves as a signaling compound. Signaling compound. Channeling with other nerve cells. It also helps you. It also helps you to focus inten intensely on what you really want. And it push push and ima en energizes you to take action and reach your goals. Those goals can include pursuing a, a romantic interest. Once smitten, a surge of dopamine helps to make you feel ex exhilarated. Mm -hmm. Exhilarated. Exhilarated. Yeah. So it's related to this reward system area. So to get the reward system is like what happens when we feel good. And so what they're talking about is this dopamine chemical, which is known as the feel good chemical, makes you feel pleasure and contributes to those feelings of pleasure and reward. Reward is like when you when you get something good for your efforts, you got rewarded, so it feels good. Um, when you spy, so when you see, that just means when you see your favorite food or win a big prize, your brain's dopamine levels soar. Soar means go up. They increase a lot. So um, it's a signaling compound. So a compound is like a chemical compound that signals. It gives a signal and it starts talking with or chatting with some other nerve cells. And this helps you to focus intensely on getting what you really want. And so that's where... Um, you take action. And so once smitten, so if you're smitten with somebody, that means you're in love with them. If you say, oh, he's so smitten with the new girl in town, you know, oh, he mean, that means, oh, he's so taken with her. He's so in love with her. And this is what gives you this um, feeling of exhilaration, the dopamine. So it's a chemical, and it gives us that feeling of being excited and, like, just really, you know, that feeling that you have when you're freshly or newly in love. Okay, I'm sorry, but we are not going to have time to finish reading this. Let me just go over a little bit if you guys are interested. It is kind of like on the one hand, it's pretty easy to understand because it's very straightforward research type thing. Um, but on the other hand, there are quite a few phrasal verbs, quite a few vocabulary words that might be new. So it's definitely worth uh, reading for the language, the English, um, but you know, if it's interesting to you, I recommend that you keep reading it on your own time. And if you need to look up words, you know, you have a online dictionary or something. But um, the subtitles are: uh, Is it stress or love? So it talks about that and about the same kind of responses of being stressed and hugs and how important giving hugs and receiving hugs can be in terms of the other chemicals that are released. One of them is known as oxytocin. It makes you feel good too. And that gets released when uh, people are hugging. So that's another thing that you might want to read about. And then it goes into the social hormones. So even these things can happen when we're on Facebook <laughs> or when we are um, doing something with our friends. It's not just about being in love, but also mothers and babies feeling connected to each other. These are other um, chemicals and hormones that give us the feelings of um, being connected, feeling um, loved, and um, helping us connect with each other. So I thought it was pretty interesting, and definitely for people who are interested in reading this type of scientific literature, it has some good uh, scientific terminology and just a higher level of vocabulary in general. Yes. So you guys... Um, any questions okay. before we finish? Yes. You guys good? Where, where can yeah. I buy this machine? <laughs> <laughs> it's a like machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Or a scan. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I'm going to end this class and we're going to start the next class. So if you want to talk about love or being in love or things related to that, then join me in the next class and we are going to be having a conversation so you get more chance to speak and express yourself. Thanks you thanks you guys for coming to class and reading. You guys did a good job. Thank see you very you much. Okay. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay, see ya. Yeah, see you. Bye bye. Me too. Okay.